Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first of our fall lectures at the Historical Society of Frankfurt once again. Um, we're back for another season, and this time we are still virtual, but hopefully we will maybe have some live ones coming up over the next three. So uh, October, November, December. Keep uh, keep your ears peeled for maybe in, uh, in person. Um, tonight we have our one of our board of directors, uh, John Buffington, who is going to talk to us about the history of dummy cars. And I will just leave it to him to give you more explanation there because I uh, jumped into this last minute. So thanks again uh, for some, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, let me turn it over to John here. Hi, John. Good evening, Good evening everybody. Uh, I'm speaking tonight from uh, our improvised studio in the exhibition room uh, of the Historical Society of Frankfurt. Uh, our current exhibition, incidentally, is on early photography in the Frankfurt area. And we're going to have a book coming out very soon. Uh, this is a draft still, uh, which will be made available uh, for those who are interested in that subject. I am going to talk about the, the dummy car, which is a, a transitional phase of, of rapid uh, rail transit uh, between horse-drawn and, and electric streetcars. Um, before I do that, I want to mention a few things that we, we do here. Some, th these programs, there are a lot of people out there these days that, that have uh, never actually been here and seen what we do, uh, but who have taken to uh, tuning in at least some of the time, I hope a lot of the time. Uh, to our, uh, our program since we started broadcasting as a, as a necessity because we, we had to su su suspend our um, programs, our live programs during the pandemic. So we have a whole new audience uh, that uh, doesn't maybe know too much about what we do here. We have a museum in the basement, um, which is uh, a, a very interesting way of becoming acquainted with with sort of a lifestyle of earlier ages in, in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, we have a special collections library upstairs, which is sort of the definitive place to go on Frankfurt history for documents and books. Uh, we have a garden outside, which we're in the process of restoring with um, native plants. Uh, and all in all, we're quite an active group here. This is just, these programs are just the tip of the iceberg, but it's a very important tip. We've been doing programs since 1905. Uh, a group of uh, local uh, executives and, and owners of the mills, I suspect mostly, uh, we, during the industrial age, uh, got together and started uh, trading stories about Frankfurt history in 1905, and we've been doing something of the sort on a regular schedule ever since. We hope you uh, are becoming accustomed to uh, joining us for those regularly. And if so, if you think this is valuable, we would love to have you join the society. Uh, our base uh, charge for for membership is is twenty is just twenty dollars. For a twenty with a twenty dollar membership, you get this refrigerator magnet. Oh, there we go. Refrigerator magnet, which this this in the current round, it's it's uh, the uh, Duffield compass, which is one of the serious treasures in our museum. Uh, and uh, you get a little uh, write-up about what that's all about. Uh, we also have available, if you uh, choose to uh, put in uh, more than $45, which costs us about $25 to acquire and ship this book on um, various aspects of Frankfurt history. Uh, which is a very nice introduction to the history of the borough of Frankfurt during the time it was a borough before it was uh, part of the city of Philadelphia. 
John Manton gave us the rights to reproduce that, bless his heart. Um, so uh, we, we'll ship you a copy of the book if you uh, join with a, a contribution of, of more than the $25, at least the $25 that it, it costs us to, to handle it. Uh, so the talk tonight is on the, uh, the history of the dummy car. Before there were dummy cars, there were horse-drawn streetcars. Now, a streetcar doesn't necessarily have to have rails, but it commonly does. And the prior to uh, the uh, dummy car, we had streetcars drawn by horses. And that's what we put out uh, with the announcement of this meeting. Vanessa, if you can show that, uh, that illustration. Yeah, there it is. Um, so that's a horse-drawn streetcar, which you're going to hear a membership mention of in this in this talk. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, and we will uh, we will show you some pictures of dummy cars as we go along. So, Mr. Creighton, the uh, the author of this talk that uh, I'm about to uh, to read. He gave this talk in 1916 to the society, uh, and he, he wasn't yet on the board, I don't believe. He certainly wasn't president yet, but uh, he did subsequently become the president of the society and was when he died in uh, 1929. So he, having, having done that, he can't uh, deliver the talk himself tonight, so I'm, I'm standing in for him. So this is the history of the, Tom, of the dummy car by Thomas Crate. The question of rapid transit between Frankfurt and Philadelphia has always been an important one. The stagecoach of 1830 was entirely too slow. And so in February 1832, the Philadelphia and Trenton Railroad was incorporated as a steam road. And for a short time, car cars that were pulled by horses conveyed the good people of Frankfurt to the city. Again, in May 1857, the Philadelphia and Delaware River Railroad was chartered, giving them a right to build the road from Philadelphia to Frankfurt, upon which cars drawn by horses could be used. These were all in the line of quick transit, and no doubt were a great improvement over the stagecoaches, which were drawn by horses over ill-constructed roads that were almost impassable in bad weather. But at last, relief was at hand. The clouds were rolling away, and a ray of sunshine seemed to gild all Frankfurt, for real rapid transit was coming at last. The horse cars that had been in use from January 1858 to November 1863 were laid away, and the horses like those used in, on the stages had to find other employment, for the dummies were coming to the relief of the inhabitants of Frankfurt. True, there was a line of cars drawn by horses on Paul Street, but nearly everybody patronized the dummies in order to make quicker time. Uh, let's show a dummy car, please, Vanessa. It was a gala day in Frankfurt when the first dummy arrived. It was called the Alpha. The engine and boiler were situated in the front part of the car, and as the boiler was an upright one, there was a narrow seat for the engineer between them. Back of him, looking into the car, was a tiny square window that answered for ventilation in the summer and was a means of communication with the conductor. I know that this seat back of the window was a favorite one of mine, for from there I could catch a glimpse over the shoulder of the engineer of the road over which we were to traverse. It is said of this car that on one of her trips she collided with a shifting engine of the Reading Railroad called the B. The dummy car was not damaged, but the engineer in his excitement reversed his engine and backed at full speed to the depot at 4th and Burke Street where the car fell into the salt pit and was badly damaged. 
there is no mention of what befell the passengers. At first, there were only two cars. I have mentioned the Alpha. The other one was called the Seagull, and there was an oval picture painted on the outside of the car. In it, there was a view of the sea with a great wave, and skimming over that was a picture of a seagull. I suppose an emblem of how this dummy would skim over the tracks from Frankfurt to Philadelphia. I well remember this car, for as all of the school children had a holiday to celebrate its arrival, we were all taken in it for a ride, and when we reached Frankfurt Creek at the border of the town, we were politely told that that was the end of the trip and we could walk home again. As the business of the road increased, other cars were added until there were six, and they were known by their numbers. The Alpha and Seagull were numbers one and two. The numbers were increased as additional cars were placed on the road. For 30 years, from 1863 to 1893, these cars conveyed the people of Frankfurt from their homes to the city, and I suppose everyone of middle age has a vivid recollection of, of them. Let's uh, show the second uh, dummy car, please, uh, Venice. I well remember that not many years ago, while in New York, I met a gentleman who inquired where I lived. I told him in Frankfurt, and then he laughed and said, I well remember your dummies. I rode out there once from the city. There were two long seats, one on each side, and as we traveled Kensington Avenue, with a great noise and jolting, I was amused to watch the people trying to keep their seats and their balance. I want to say that I have traveled all around the world, but never experienced anything like your dummies. In 1893, when the trolley was first introduced, there were 11 dummies. Let's uh, show the uh, trolley car. We have here a... Um, a model from our museum of the trolley cars that replaced the dummy car. So you've seen the pictures of the, uh, of the dummy. This is a double-decker, as you can see. I think he's going to talk about that here. Um, in 1893, when the trolley was introduced, there were 11 dummies. In order to accommodate more people, the old horse cars were used in the rear of the dummies as trailers, and the roof was utilized also. A spiral stairway made of light iron was hooked on the rear end of the car as a means of access. We have the, this ladder, which was patented by Thomas Castor of Frankfurt. The model is now in the possession of the society. For the comfort of those riding on the top, of the trailer, an awning was placed over the seats. These seats were always occupied in fair weather as they afforded the passenger a splendid view of the country on the way to the city. When the cars reached the covered bridge at Frankfurt Creek, there was a rush and a roar with a rattling of planks. Let's uh, show the bridge, please, Vanessa. Uh, with a rattling of planks, and there was very little room between the awning frame and the roof of the bridge. These trailers were not heated in winter, but to keep the feet warm, the bottom of the cars was filled with salt hay. It is needless to say that this soon became a disagreeable mass after a rain or a snowstorm. The dummies had a seating capacity of 32 people, the trailers 32 also, while the top would accommodate 20. It is needless to say that the art of crowding a car was done as successfully then as now, and Mr. Thomas Kim told me that on one Memorial Day he carried 2,384 passengers. The question has been asked, why were these cars called dummies? And it might be answered as follows. These cars have been called dummies from the desire of the inventor to make them look like a horse car and yet to be propelled by steam power. A car that would run without noise or smoke. Some of the dummies were considered faster than others. It is said that number nine was capable of making the quickest run to the city. On one of these occasions, the conductor of number nine, Joseph Rittman, 
was desirous of taking the Reading train for New York that left at 12 o'clock midnight to see Bud Howe compete in a walking match in New York City. Mr. Frank Golden, who was engineer of the car, left Frankfurt at 11.30 and arrived at the depot Kensington Avenue and Cumberland Street in 11 minutes. About the year 1872, nearly all the horses in Philadelphia had the disease called the epizooty. This seriously crippled the horse car lines and experiments were made of running dummies to Jackson Street. One car made the round trip going down 5th Street to Jackson and returning by the way of 6th Street. This little outing of one of the dummies created quite an excitement in the center of the city and the streets were lined with people. The experiment was not a success, however, and as horses were brought to the city from the west, the running of the horse cars was resumed. Sad was the ending of the useful dummy cars which had so faithfully performed their work so many years. After the entrance of the new mode of trolley transit in 1893, the cars were sold. First one to leave, number eight, was bought by the Bangor and Portland Railroad running from Bangor to Portland at the entrance to the Water Gap, and some 10 years ago, the writer had the privilege of riding in it between the two towns. It seemed like a little bit of old times as I rode in the car through the hilly country of the Gap. Another, number nine, was sent to Barnegat, where it conveyed the passengers along shore for several years. The remaining cars were sent to the car barn at Lanark, to run on the Westchester Pike. Sent to the car barn at Lanark to run on the Westchester Pike between 63rd Street at Market and Newtown Square, a distance of 12 miles. They were used by the company for a special purpose as the as by their charter at that time they could not use trolley privileges on this road but were compelled to use steam power the dummy cars were not successful there they could not ascend the steep hills and one night at a fire which destroyed the car barn they were all burned except one that was fitted up as a freight car and carried milk to the city for many years no history of the dummies would be complete unless mention is made of the famous curve at the entrance to the town. Here, after leaving Kensington Avenue, a graceful curve is made, and on a grade of 167 feet to the mile, many a car has met its defeat. How it would puff and blow, stop, and go on, and finally stop altogether. Go back again, try it all over and perhaps some of the athletic passengers would get out and help push. It required 125 pounds of steam to make the ascent with a trailer and 60 pounds without one. And if an engineer did not have that amount of steam at Buckius Street, he would stop at Adams Street and blow up his fire. Near Adams Street was the switch, and here the trailers were left or taken on as the load warranted. Great difficulty was exper experienced in running these cars during the winter months. During the blizzard of the winter of 1866, the road was tied up for several days. It is related that the four-horse sleigh belonging to Mr. Nestor of Fox Chase, who ran the stage line, arrived in Frankfurt one morning while the employees were waiting at the depot. They all left the depot, took a day off, and a sleigh ride to Fox Chase in return. In March 1888, the road was blocked by deep drifts from Sunday night until the following Thursday. Many stories are related of the dummies. One of the best is as follows. A new hostler employed at the depot was instructed to fill the boiler with water. Not knowing the right valve, he put the hose down the smokestack, and as the water would mute would naturally run out of the grate at the bottom, he became alarmed and informed the boss that the bottom had fell out of the boiler. Hostler, by the way, uh, is a term which during Mr. Uh, 
Creighton's life changed its meaning. It was originally a hostel, it of course is an inn, and a hosteler is a person, not the person who runs the inn, but it's the person who manages the horses and mules at the inn. And uh, during Mr. Uh, Creighton's lifetime, that person became, instead of a horse who managed horses and mules, he was the person who drove the, um, the engine into the barn and back out again. Another story is it follows. A stranger in Frankfurt, after waiting on a street corner for a long time to take the car to the city, became impatient and stopping a passerby inquired in angry tones, how often does these fools' cars run? The average time from Frankfurt to Forthenburg Street was 30 minutes, to the new depot at Kensington Avenue and Cumberland Street, 20 minutes. The last car from the city would arrive in Frankfurt at 12.55 at night, and the first car would leave in the morning at 5.20. During the rush hours, they would run from 15 to 20 minutes apart, in the middle of the day every 30 minutes. The time from Frankfurt to Market Street was about 58 minutes. Conductors were paid $2.50 per day of from 12 to 14 hours. Engineers were paid by the month about $70 each. They also received a bonus of $60 a year, paid quarterly, if their engines were kept in first-class condition and had no accidents to occur. Men who worked on Sunday received $3.50 per day. In 1872, the following... Okay, now he gives a, a list of, of engineers, which uh, probably is not really interesting these days. I'm going to skip that. Some account should be made of the roadbed at that time. At first the rails were used, were used were of cast iron, each one only eight feet long. These would be spiked on long stringers. In summertime these rails would expand and spring up. Then the engineer would stop and take the spikes and the sledgehammer which he hammered with him and repair the track. There was the same trouble with deep water during rains at the railroad crossing at Harrogate then as there is now, and the cars would have to stop until the water had subsided. Sometimes the tracks would be covered to a depth of three feet. The tracks were watched by a man employed by the, for that purpose, one who devoted his whole life to the watchful care of others, and it is said he was expected to walk every day from Frankfurt to the depot, Fourth and Burke Street, but that he was allowed to ride back. <clears throat> As the covered bridge at the Frankfurt Creek was owned by the railroad company, a watchman was employed there to prevent fires, and no wagons or teams were allowed to cross under penalty of $10. The reversing or turning of these dummies was quite a problem. At first, a temporary turntable was built on the street at Frankfurt Avenue and Eric Street, but was afterwards placed in the rear of the present Stone Depot. Now, the Stone Depot he's talking about, we haven't shown yet that. Uh, can we show the uh, depot, please, uh, Vanessa? Um, the most serious disaster that ever occurred on the road was a collision at the grade crossing at Harrogate with an excursion train returning from New York. This happened at nine o'clock on Sunday night, September 26, 1875. Two persons were instantly killed, Thomas Adams and Mrs. O'Donnell, while three others died within a few days. Many others were injured. Thomas Adams was an engineer on the road, but the night of the accident was riding inside as a passenger. Mr. Harry S. Adams, whom we all know so well, was with his father at the time of the accident. They were sitting in the rear of the dummy near the door. Mr. Adams stepped outside of the door on the platform to speak to the brakeman, and seeing the approaching train, he jumped and was instantly killed while his son inside was not injured. The conductor of the car was Charles Williamson, and the engineer was Tony Evans. They both jumped and so escaped injury. This disaster cost the road over $65,000 in damages, 
but still it was a good year as they paid 12% dividend. Mr. Thomas Kim, through whose kindness I have collected the data for my story, tells me that he was in bed on the night of the accident, that he was sent for and told to take car number one to the place of the disaster, and that he gathered many fragments of the bodies, among them a head. These he placed in a keg, and placing it before him in the engine room of his car, he conveyed them to the police station at Frankfurt. Something must be said of the executive work of the road. Mr. Albert Worrell had full charge of the running of the cars, and we all remember how he would blow his whistle, a signal for the starting of the cars. Mr. Samuel Ford cared, cared for the construction work. While at the depot, there was a machine shop where new cars were made and old cars were placed. Cars were also built by outside shops. The first dummies used on the road were built by the Grison Long Company, whose works were on Beach Street. The engine was, no, was what was known as a twin engine with a six by 10 and a half stroke and was of 15 horsepower, 15 horsepower. The boiler was an upright one and about 1600 pounds of hard coal was used during the day. The temperature often exceeded 100 degrees in the small engine room. I must mention the bell and whistle of the dummy car. The bell was on the roof of the car suspended between two upright posts and was pulled on a cord from the engine room. There was also a whistle controlled by the engineer. These signals were in great demand in going down Kensington Avenue, notifying the farmers to clear the tracks. And it is said that if a man with a load of hay refused to leave the track, some of the engineers would fire up, causing a cloud of sparks to fill the air. This hint was always sufficient for the driver of a load of hay. The old depot at 4th and Burke Streets was abandoned in January 1872 and the com company moved into the new one at Cumberland Street and Kensington Avenue. Thomas Scott, who had the honor of taking the first dummy into the new depot, was so overcome with the privilege that he could not wait until the doors were opened, but backed his car through them, tearing them off their hinges. Some of the men who worked in this shop included Ephraim Woodhouse, who painted, gilded, grained, and adorned the cars with landscapes. And then there's a list of more folks who worked there. The question of fare was an interesting one. Previous to the war, the fare from the city to Frankfurt or return was 10 cents, making the fare for the round trip to the city 20 cents. It was afterwards reduced to 7 cents, and then the five cents to Columbia Avenue, which was in force several years. Round rubber buttons with a hole in the center and strung on a leather thong were used as tickets, and these were sold six for a quarter. <coughs> Excuse me. Workmen's tickets, 12 cents for the round trip, were also sold. School children's tickets were sold 12 for a dollar. About 1892 to 3, a register was introduced for the collection of fares. It was a harp-shaped harp design, nickel-plated, and was hung around the neck of the conductor by a leather strap resting on his breast. There were two leather cords hanging beneath, and there was a great pulling and jingling of bells as the fares were collected. And then there's a long list of conductors. Among all of the employees of this road, there is one man whose name should have, have special mention, that of James Moore, who was employed at the Frankfurt Depot as hostler. It was his duty to look after the cars, clean them, rub them down, and keep them in condition. He spent many years there <coughs> and was a quiet, industrious citizen and did his work well. There is no doubt that in the preparation of this article, I have neglected to mention the names of some of the employees of the road. If I should have done, done so, I would appreciate any additions and any reminiscences that would add to the interest of the paper. I desire to thank the following person who, persons who have so kindly assisted me, Mr. Thomas Kim, Mr. Lewis Miller, Charles Castor, Mr. Robert T. Corson, Mr. Elwood Castor, James France, files of the Holmesburg and Frankfurt Gazette.
That's the end of the paper as written. Uh, one other remark about host, the word hostler. That's the American pronunciation according in, to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which is, my, in my opinion, the authoritative source of American pronunciation and spelling. But in England, it's pronounced ostler. Comes from French, and, and I'm told that uh, in, in the French it would be ostler. So uh, that's a difference between American and English. English, uh, two countries divided by a single language. And uh, we do that on purpose because uh, Noah Webster uh, thought we should uh, sort of divide ourselves on purpose after the, from the English after the Revolution. Great man, Noah Webster. So that's uh, what I have to say about those subjects. Please do join the society if you um, feel so inclined. That uh, that applicate the uh, the form for doing that is at the uh, website, the Historical Society of Frankfurt website, I believe. And uh, we would love to have you uh, join us. Thank you. This program has been uh, presented by the Historical Society of Frankfurt. Uh, producer Vanessa Couvreur. Uh, stage manager, uh, her mother, uh, her mother Susan Kuzu. Thank you. Anyways, thank you, John. That was a really fun read. I, I do appreciate how it was um, written. I think it was, um, you know, not devoid of some humor, which seems to, you know, I feel like they had that in the past with these papers written in it. And I'm glad that it comes through even as we're reading them um, currently in, in today's times. Um, I do have those couple images that you sent to me later on if you wanna go over them really quick. I'm not sure if you were prepared for that at all. Um, I, I, I didn't get at it. Um, let's, uh, let's add them later. Uh, okay. If we're gonna if we're gonna add something, I, I hope we can edit this uh, edit edit some information in. Yeah, um, yeah, we can add them to the Facebook uh, page and and also I don't know if they'll be in YouTube, but Facebook would be the best place to to check in for those extra images. Um, one of our fellow board members did find some extra information about dummy cars, um, and there are a couple of images, but also some um, some things written that could be of interest as well. So. If you're interested in the dummy cars, please check it out. Um, they look pretty oh, good. Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, there's a publication that reproduced this paper. It's called, uh, uh, what's it called? It, Frankfurt, well, Frankfurt, what did I do with that? No, what did I do with it? What did I do with it? No. All right. It, it, the Frankfurt. We'll we'll put it up on the site. We'll put it up on the site. Sounds good. Yeah. And of course, as always, um, please you know, ask questions, leave comments. If there's anything we didn't cover, ask us. We're happy to engage. Um, the more engagement we get, the more alive the whole institution is. Um, just as John was saying, you know, whether it's by joining us in membership or by just participating in the online streaming that we do. So we're so happy that you all came to visit. Um, I do see, we just had a couple people, it looks like they joined in the past few minutes and I'm so sorry that you joined late. I hope you get to watch the video in its entirety later on and post any questions that you have. Um, maybe there's a little comment here, let's see. Dummies come to Frankfurt from Mark. <laughs> Mark Heiser, he says, thank you so much for sharing this story. Very interesting and humorous. Dummies come to Frankfurt. Much appreciated. Yes. All right. Well, thank you again, John. And uh, we will see you next month. Um, maybe I can give you a little brief rundown of what is in store for next month. And John, maybe you can verify this with me. It looks like we have the Lewis and Clark Expedition, A Tale of Two Cities, presented by Professor Stephen Medvick. So yes, he has confirmed that he's, he's going to do that for us. Awesome. That sounds like a good one. Lewis and Clark is definitely a, a really 
strong story to talk about and, um, you know, goes way beyond Frankfurt. And I'm glad that we can tie it into our work here. So please join us next month too. And um, hope to see you then. All right. Good night. Good night.